Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Into the Stratosphere with Dr. Bishop and friends. We've got a doctor in the house today. I'm Malva Kajali, the events assistant here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming a star-studded panel composed of Regina Anderson, Gwendolyn Baxley, Damaris Dunn, Carolyn Eanes, Nicole Hamilton, Iona Op Opidi, Tamsin Wojtanowski, Nassim Zarifi, and of course the transcendent luminescent Dr. Elizabeth Bishop uh, for the first conversation in a new monthly series that I'll let Dr. Bishop tell you more about shortly. We're also so lucky to have the poet Adam Faulkner here with us today who will read to close today's program. Um, We've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. That we have for many events named many of those who have lost their lives to police violence just within the last year alone. Uh, I would like to dedicate today's program to Breonna Taylor who was murdered in her sleep by police just over a year ago on March 13th under the modern day equivalent of the slave era jump warrant. And uh, as we found out in the past year in anticipation of the city of Louisville's multi-million dollar redevelopment plan uh, of the area in which Brianna Taylor lived. Uh, we think it's important to sort of remind ourselves of these, uh, these facts and how they're sort of incongruity with one another um, as we mourn her death, uh, that we, you know, that both of these acknowledgements really flow from the same extractive logics of colonialism, of white settler expansion that built this country. Uh, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. Uh, now I'm so excited to hand it over to my dear comrade, Nick Bennett. Thank you, Malika. Um, I just want to say a few quick words. Um, I want to share my gratitude to Bishop for orchestrating today's event and bringing together so many incredible, pe incredible people doing the vital work that needs to be done. Um, this series, as we will, I'm sure it will be said, originates with Bishop's critics page from September 2020, where they said, party as a mode of survival. So in the spirit of doing the necessary work and partying as a mode of survival, I am so happy we're all present today to inaugurate this new series, and I share lots of love and gratitude with everyone. It is also, and now, my honor to welcome our wonderful curator, Dr. Bishop. She is a writer, researcher, professor, youth advocate, Nietzschean, and surf monk. She's authored two books, Becoming Activist, Critical Literacy, and Youth Organizing, and, and Embodying Theory, Epistemology, Aesthetics, and Resistance. We will drop some links to all of these in the chat shortly. Uh, Dr. Bishop lives in Brooklyn where she is tuning in from the Playa Quarantina along with her dog, Messi. So without further ado, Bishop, beam us up. I love that you shouted out Playa Quarantina. Um, what's up everybody, good afternoon. I, every time we do these, I'm stoked because it's all my favorite people and people who are about to become my favorite people. I scripted out what I'm gonna say to y'all cause I can say things forever. So. Um, first, huge thanks to, and gratitude to the Brooklyn Rail, to the team, particularly Nick and Malvika, without whom none of this would be possible. And then also to my people at the Rail who are like always my people at the Rail, Jeremy, Juliet, Kepler, he got a shout out in the pre-check, um, JC Forever, other folks like that, you know, um, Charlie, the publish, uh, the editor-in-chief, and then of course Fong, the publisher, and Fong's recurring invitation that has allowed us to make space for this essentially to recognize the power of these sorts of writerly, artistic, and political collaborations. So uh, the description of the series, Into the Stratosphere, is, quote, a new series that brings together educators, activists, and activists into a rhizomatic orbit of solidarity, knowledge building, and critical love. And I'm going to circle back to the concept of the rhizome at the end. But really, like, I think the power of this work is at the nexus of solidarity, knowledge building, and critical love. Um, and to forever quote James Baldwin, it's because if we hadn't loved each other, none of us would have survived it. So today we're launching episode one and I'm stoked. Um, I'm bringing back together a range of contributors from the September 2020 issue to talk about the now, although there'll be some reference probably to what was published then. We published six months into this unprecedented crisis. 
And we're continuing the series over the next months. And then we're taking over the guest critic page again, September, 2021, um, one year later, which I think is gonna be really profound and rhizomatic in its own ways. September, 2020, I wrote about celebrating our radiant survival and have been really trying to center that in my conversations with people. So we had four folks on the mic in December to throw a panel that would have usually been a party at the rail. And that was such a love fest that we kicked this off. And now we've got basically everybody else, including folks in the audience that were also contributors. So to speak to just today, Nicole Hamilton asked me, like, what is it now? If it was the world on fire then, which was the title of my introduction, then what are we dealing with now? And we started talking about smoldering embers and controlled burns. And then Regina had me talking about flashlights to illuminate paths in front of each other when we are lost in the dark. And that there's an eternal flame in the poetics, uh, the, we, the quantum poetics of uplifting justice and solidarity. So right now I'm thinking about how we sustain our collective wellness in a moment of profound exhaustion and deeply thinking about the future, about community care and moving from world on fire to smoldering embers, controlled burns, illuminations, um, to kind of invert Shakespeare's Polonius, what we need is more light than heat. And lastly, I'll tell you about today. So the stratosphere, it was our friend, Dr. Yolanda C. the Ruiz about the rail said to me, boo, you're going into the stratosphere. And I kept that phrase. And so for us, it's like the stratosphere actually scientifically is a layer made of many layers. So that works as we think about unpeeling and unpacking and undoing white supremacy, toxic masculinity, the internalized morality of neoliberalism in the grind on our bodies and trying to rid traces of fascism from our lives. So I brought together all these revolutionaries and radical educators who are about to take the mic um, to bring ideas and spirits into orbit. Nicole, Damaris, Regina, Gwen, Nassim, Carolyn, Yana, Tamsin, and we're gonna end with um, dope poet Adam Faulkner. And a final note about the rhizome, because that word's in the description. So um, it, like in Phil it's a biological term about a root structure, but philosophers Deleuze and Guattari took it into the philosophical arena in late, modern France, right? Like Paris 68 kind of moment. And when th thinking could be linear on a scale or arboreal like a tree, they were like, no, it's rhizomatic and it branches out in lots of different directions. And that's useful for us here because this is basically what they say about it. This is from their Thousand Plateaus, um, that it's conceived of as an open system and that, it, sorry, my, it was reminding me to move my car. Um, it's conceived of as an open system. And the plateaus of that system are reached when circumstances combine to bring an activity to a pitch of intensity that does not dissipate. It heightens energies and is sustained long enough to achieve after it images of its dynamism that can be reactivated or injected into other activities, creating a fabric of intensive reactivated statuses between which any number of connecting roots can exist. Just check this last part of that. I'm gonna pass the mic to Nicole. The best way of all to approach this is to read it as a challenge to pry open the vacant spaces that would enable you to build your life and the lives of the people around you into a plateau of intensity that would leave after images of its dynamism that could be reinjected into still other lives, creating a fabric of heightened states through which any number, the greatest number of connecting roots would exist. Some people call this promiscuity, we call it revolution. Um, that's Deleuze and Guattari. I, that's, my work is built off of that, even though I'm trying to throw away the white Eurocentric whateverness of all that and as I move forward in my work. Um, but the key idea here is like we move through those environments together. So with that, I'm throwing the mic to Nicole Hamilton to kick us off. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Let's go. Now I'm just mad. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? We talking about rhizomes and connective structures and things. I don't even know what to say, um, except for thank you so much for having me here. I'm really um, honored to be amongst all these great folks again. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, I really don't have a lot prepared to say. I will be honest with you. I really am not here, but I was just here yesterday, wherever this screensaver is, and I'm on, I'm still in vacation mode. Um, but as Bishop just read that part about the rhizomes, like right, right before I came on here, I was like, let me read some more about these rhizomes. And this web of connectivity that is talking about that gives us an opportunity to like uh, plant things and branch out into future and other people's lives and, you know, to keep it going. I, and, and it struck me like that could be used for good or for bad. Um, you know, there could be rhizomes of destructive and harmful patterns that we create um, it, 
means of survival, whatever have you. Um, and then there could also, we can flip it on its axis and create rhizomes of light and uh, well-being and communities of care and like branching out into uh, things that are useful and helpful and edifying. Um, and that I wanted to start this time, my little five minutes with a little bit of storytelling and because I was just at a restorative uh, justice conference and, you know, talked a lot about storytelling and the power of stories. And also because I feel have anything brilliant to say. So I'm just gonna tell a story. Um, I remember when the world caught on fire and um, you know, the last day of work, I remember the last day of going to the office that I work at. I remember um, the last day of being in my apartment. My, I talked to my mom the day before and she lives in Philadelphia and she also has a chronic illness. And at the time of the day, this time in the, in, you know, where we were like 800 plus people were dying in New York city daily. And I remember just watching TV and crying. And I remember my mom saying, I don't know if you're going to be able to get to me. If something happens, I don't know if I'm able to New York, I don't know if they're going to shut the tunnel down. I don't know. And I don't think I'm going to make it. And so at that moment I was like, Oh, okay. You know, I knew that inevitably the time would be coming soon that I would have to go home and care for my mom. I'm the only child and my mom's only child. Um, and so I knew that that would happen, but I, the world caught on fire and then it created a kind of rhizomatic things that were connecting other dots that I was not maybe ready for at the time. Uh, there was some stuff in the suitcase. My husband and I walked to uh, the Brooklyn Marriott because there were no buses running at that time to rent a car to go to my mom. And we were the only people in the Holland Tunnel. I took a video, I was like, this has never happened before. Our car was the only car driving. And we got there, you know, I spent the first couple of days just trying to organize things for my mom because when the world shuts down, you can't go to physical therapy. You can't do things that you need to do to sustain your life um, when the world is on fire. So realizing I'm like, <laughs> I kept writing this thing this morning, like I was trying to put out all of these fires of the world being on fire. And I had like a cup, straw, fill of water, I didn't have a hose. I didn't have like all the things I needed. I didn't have a fire suit. I didn't have any training. I didn't have any tools. I didn't have anything that I needed. And I'm walking around to all these burning infernos with a cup and a straw. Like, what can I do to put these fires out? Um, and I kept asking myself, and this, so this was a, this was April 18th, um, and I was there for 18 weeks straight. Never left there. Um, never came back to my apartment, which I still have. I'm still here. So having two, leaving in two places, you know, doing a lot of just running around um, and not realizing that like that, that, that old saying, take care of yourself, ask on first so that you can put the fire out so that you can take care of others who might be experiencing the fire. I worked myself into a state of absolute exhaustion and I didn't realize it until I, I looked in the mirror. I was like, I don't even look myself. I don't feel like myself. I couldn't sleep well, nothing that I was eating tasted like food I wanted to eat. I couldn't even see, like I just felt sick. Um, and I, my birthday came around this year and I said to my husband, I said, I don't want a thing. Don't buy me a thing. I need to go somewhere. I need to get on a plane, COVID be damned. You know, I need to get tests and get vaccines and do whatever needs to happen. I need to go. And that was the first time I just came back this morning, but realizing the absolute necessity for us to not always like go someplace tropical and lay on the beach, although there's nothing wrong with that. And that's fantastic and wonderful. But, um, you know, in the, in the rigmarole and the, and the panic of a world being on fire, like I'm, I, I don't have a self-care practice. I never really had one. And I created a web of negative rhizomes for myself. I created two bulging discs in my from working at home improperly. I created uh, health issues for myself for not moving. I created a horrible way of not going outside and getting vitamin D. So having vitamin D deficiency just because you're inside. Um, all these different things that can be remedied um, with some attention in the right area. So, uh, so when you think about radical self-care, sometimes it's not even so radical. And I kept asking myself these, these questions this morning, like when did I get, when did I ever learn that like my output was more important than my personal outcomes for myself and my family? When did I ever learn that taking a break was frowned upon? 
when did I ever learn that being busy meant that I must be important and therefore doing something right? When did I ever learn that taking a nap was being lazy? Where did I ever learn that going, going out for lunch is no longer a thing sometimes or it wasn't then, you just work through that. That lunch didn't need to be a thing. When did I start comparing myself to others, myself to others all the time? And what, what, how much work somebody else is doing and how does that make me feel about the work that I'm doing? When did I forget how to say no? And like, what is the cost of all this? And the cost is uh, economical. Um, if we don't stop and don't take a break, don't take a rest and don't, don't do it grudgingly to ourselves, it is catastrophic. I don't know when I learned all those things. I think I learned them around a, the culmination of my life and every turn. Um, and I don't know, I don't ever want to pass those questions, those traits on to other people. I don't want that to be my, my rhizome spread. I want my rhizome spread to be the complete opposite of that. But my question now for these burning is, how do you take the good things that happened now that my mother's doing much better? She's well now, she's better than us. Um, I started a whole business during this time and, and it's thriving and doing really well. That's great. Um, but I'm tired. And so how do I um, create systems and things that work for other people that work for myself and find a balance that I don't um, kill myself in the process, literally, um, that I don't wake up and not love what I'm doing, that I don't wake up and not want to be in the places where I am, that I also have balance of like joy and happiness and love and prosperity can come with that and all these other things can come with that so I have just been um, trying to figure out what are the rhizomes to plant what are the, that in the stage of being that it's not just a root and it's not just the branch it's all the thing and it's this thing in the middle that it comes comes from it what is the thing that I want to be spreading um, light, of course, goodness, of course. Um, but also, um, I have unlearned and watch from other people how they are doing it. Like when Bishop goes someplace and like doing some surfing, I'm like, yes, what is surfing? I need to find my surfing. Like when, like, what are the, how do we undo that? All those questions that have been built up for our entire lives, for my entire life. How do I, where do I start? How do I undo it? So I started by going on vacation, which was awesome. I'm still there, as you can see. Um, I still have on my Chiquita banana head wrap and I'm gonna continue wearing it all week. And um, maybe that's the start for me, just to continue to um, perpetuate um, the light and the joy. And I'm over my time, but I do wanna just share something that I read this morning very quickly. Um, I have a coworker who is super awesome. And they have a handle called Deeply Rooted Ritual on Instagram. And this is what I, I don't know if you all can see it, but this is what I went to this morning. I'm logging back onto Instagram in a week and a half. Rest and replenish for a black liberation. And this time, many of us are more burnt out than we'd like to recognize. As days progress, the deeper we wear on our the deeper we wear on our physical and spiritual bodies. As we train to warmer times, could consider what could it mean to replenish and refill our cups. Let in all that feels good and let go of the rest. What social interactions nourish you most like this? Which leave you feeling drained? Which inspire and give and take? And which asks for your fullness with little to nothing in return? When we take time for rest, do we find ourselves gravitating back towards the people, places, and environments that cause us to stress? Breathe. Give yourself grace for the habits we have created out of survival or sadness. How do you care for your body in moments of rest? Adorn with colors, stones, fabrics that are pleasing to the eye and touch, lather with butters and douse in oils. Let in all that feels good and let go of the rest. Ashe. Thank you, and I pass it now to Maris. Dag, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being vulnerable. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about like light uh, because I think everything 
that I kind of do, I, I try to push forward with like love and light more recently with joy, right? Because that has become my work um, because I kind of was given the invitation by my advisor here at the University of Georgia to kind of do that work of like bringing forth joy. Um, and so I think when I think about light and I think about blackness, I'm thinking about commanding the full use of my tongue. Um, I'm thinking about um, commanding the full use of my hands. What does it mean to write uh, black people? What does it mean to write black girls? Um, what does it mean to think about our joy, um, not in relation to pain? Uh, uh, I have a professor here at UGA who is like really challenging me on that. She's like, joy, there has to be pain. And I'm like, all right, okay. And right, um, like how do we get out of this space where we are constantly comparing our joy to pain? And I think that I think that pain has to be there. I really do. Um, and so as I think about the work that I do um, as a future teacher educator, I'm thinking about schools as being like these really painful places for black and brown children, particularly for black and brown girls, and what it looks like to create spaces that are informed by them, that are informed by their grandmothers, by their mothers. Um, and so I've been sitting with that. Um, and I think like black women just bring me so much light. Um, all of the black and brown women in my life bring me so much light. Um, and then I have like some amazing co-conspirators in my life that I can count on my hands that are not necessarily all in my doc program, but <laughs> they're my, my friends in my life, like the bishops and the Emilies. Um, and so I, I feel joy knowing that this work is collective, that we are all commanding the use of our tongues, that we are all tapping into joy despite all the things that are happening around us, right? Um, uh, last year, this time I had COVID. That's what I wrote about. Um, it was hard. It was really hard. And I think that one of the things that I had to really tap into was the joy of my friends and family. And so, yeah, I, when I'm thinking about light and rhizomes, I'm thinking about what light can I bring into the world with the command of my tongue and with the command of my hands? Um, what does it mean to type Black people into history? Um, what does it mean to really name us for ourselves? Um, and I think Black feminist scholars have been doing that, but I um, I want to add to that that legacy. And so that that's what I've been thinking about um, lately as it refers to bringing in this light um, and taking care of myself, right? Like just taking care of myself because I if I I have to be well. Um, no one else around me. I can't write well if I'm if I'm not taking care of myself and so you know I think part of a PhD program is like supposed to make like kind of somehow take you out of yourself um, and I've kind of been commanding myself in this space uh, and it's hard uh, but I am finding joy in writing for us remembering us Dr. Dillard is, is one of my professors here and she tells us to remember to go back think about who you are who you came from who you are um, and really embody that and so when I come into a space, I bring Lisa Estrada done with me. I bring everybody with me, um, everybody who I love and care about. I bring them with me um, and I bring that light. So yeah, I'm gonna um, pass the mic to Regina. Thank you so much, Damaris. I feel that light. <laughs> um, hi everyone. I um, want to um, reflect back to Malvika to say thank you so much um, to the Brooklyn Rail um, for this, for understanding what we all have when we communicate with Dr. Bishop um, and just making this space. So thank you so much um, because now we're all here together um, in love and in light. Um, I too wanted to um, recognize the Space that I sit. I'm here in Washington, D.C., um, you know, where the insurrection happened. Um, but before all of that, um, the people who are here, um, the ancestors who are here, um, were uh, comprised of many different um, groups of people um, under the umbrella of the Piscataway people. So I wanted to honor and recognize them. Um, so when I first started talking with Dr. Bishop about, you know, well, we talk about lots of things, fam. Um, my 
my work is anti-poverty work. And we started talking about um, circular economy and um, when we had the first conversation. So when we, when we had the, the publication, when, when Bishop had the writing in the, in the rail, um, I didn't really talk about food. <laughs> and then when we had the first conversation in December, I didn't really talk about food. I talked about arcs and movements and um, the movements that we are all in together um, and how important that is for our bodies, for our minds, for our communities. Um, when we think about this global pandemic that we are in currently called COVID-19, but when we think about the global pandemic that existed before that, which is mass poverty, is a pandemic um, and the traumas that people lived within before COVID and, and you know, the exacerbations. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about food. <laughs> we, fought, we got there, we got there um, and, and what that means for all of us. Um, so I'm the executive director of a national nonprofit called Food Recovery Network. We are uh, a student led movement um, so we think about higher education, um, the students all across the country, we're in 46 states, we have 170 chapters currently. Um, what they do is they recover surplus food from their dining halls because their higher education institutions make way more food um, than people can eat. And what normally happens to that food is we throw it away. Um, and that's just at higher education institutions. It happens um, at grocery stores. It happens at civic centers. It happened when the pandemic first hit. Lots of places, different kinds of spaces that had lots of food because of events um, closed down and a lot of that food got thrown away. And so I wanted to start first with um, some heavy things, but please stay with me, um, just stay with me. Um, because we are going to get to the light. And I need all of you to feel like you have, you have this light and, and we need you to help shine together. And that's the rhizome. Um, and I want you to know everything that I'm about to say, feel the call. This is an invitation for all of you to be part of this work that I'm about to describe. You need to be part of this work. We welcome you into this work and please invite others. This is the movement that we are trying to do here at Food Recovery Network. Um, so the fire, um, many students that we work with across the country were born into climate crisis. When I was growing up, there was like this thing called climate change, maybe. You know, when I was a little kid, it was, we, we gotta recycle. Um, young people today, my niece who's 13, they are born in climate crisis we missed the, the boat. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is, and so that's dark, but we still have opportunity to course correct some of, some of this darkness. We can, we can course correct that by bringing in the light and we have tools to do that. Um, so Feeding America just updated their numbers around here in America um, that 42 million people are hungry. They're food insecure. So maybe they had lunch today, but they don't know if they're gonna have dinner. Maybe they didn't eat today, they might eat tomorrow. They don't have enough resources to consistently have the food that they need to nourish their bodies and their minds. They thought it was about 45 million people. So they downgraded it to 42 million people. And I don't celebrate that. I don't celebrate that. Um, we shouldn't be happy about that. Before the pandemic, there was 38 million people who were in that situation. And this is human cause. We have enough food, we have enough resources and Food Recovery Network says, we don't want 42 million people <laughs> to be hungry. We will feed them today, but tomorrow we don't want there to be a line and we can do something about that. All of us here can do something about that. And it's just a little bit of changing our practices and making sure that our light, our hands, as Damaris was saying, is helping. Um, so we can recover surplus food, from dining halls, like all the thousands of students across the country are, we can ask, you know, our, our favorite restaurants, you know, what are they doing with their surplus food? Um, we can ask our grocery stores where we get our food, what are they doing with their surplus food? There's lots of different reasons why there is surplus food. There's lots of reasons why food is thrown away and we can disrupt that. And there's a lot of details that can go into that, what it looks like for anyone's community, please be in touch with Food Recovery Network um, because we can give you all the tools that you need to begin this work. You can literally feed somebody today. You can literally feed somebody today. 
you, we all know somebody who is hungry. They might not tell you that they're hungry, um, but we can do something about that. So when we throw away all of this food, um, in 2019, um, Refed, uh, which is a really wonderful nonprofit uh, research institution, among other things, 35% of the food that we made in this country went unsold and uneaten. And I will tell you, most of the time where that food goes, it goes into landfill and it creates greenhouse gases. And in, it, 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 not only are we throwing away uh, you know, $408 billion worth of food, um, that's, which is 2% of our domestic gross product, if, if anybody cares about that. <laughs> it's a lot of food that could feed people. Um, it, it, it produces greenhouse gases. Um, and it actually, um, our footprint, when we throw away all this beautiful food, is 4% of, of um, our total greenhouse gas emissions. We could stop that. It just takes a little bit of retorking <laughs> or twerking of the system that is currently not built to help all of us, and it could be. So that's some of the darkness. Now let's get into the controlled burn and the smolder. Um, our students are here to show all of us, right? We can, in 45 minutes from, let's uh, put all this beautiful food that went unsold um, into some trays. Well, let's carry that, bike it, walk it, doesn't matter, over to a church, a homeless shelter, a domestic violence shelter, an after school program. There's lots of different frontline nonprofits that are feeding our neighbors and we can give them this beautiful food. Our students who were born into climate crisis said the reason why they want to participate with Food Recovery Network is because when you hear things like 42 million people who are hungry, when you hear things like our environment is warming up, you, it's such a huge concept and you, start, you can start to feel hopeless. But when you feed people with this precious food, it gives them hope. So, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the wonderful philosopher Rihanna, and she says you can find love in a hopeless place. This is what you can do when you when you share food. Don't throw it away. Stop that today. Um, so um, when we recover our food, and again, there's so many details on how to do it. It's super easy. I've done it. It's super easy and it's fun. So here's the here's the controlled burn. These are dire statistics um, that we can change today and we can laugh, we can have joy. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever um, been in interaction with people who are homeless and stop moralizing why people are homeless. Um, they, they laugh, they joke around, they share what they have when we all come together. So we can stop the cycle. When we recover food, we promote jobs. We, when, we, when we recover food, we reclaim all this lost revenue. Um, when we, recover food, we reconnect with dignity. The dignity for the people who grew the food, the dignity for the people who prepared the food. Stop asking people who are working shift work, who take all of this time, love and energy to make food and then ask them to throw it away. Let's infuse dignity back into the work that they are doing. These are essential workers. Let's show them how much we care about them and not throw away the food that they prepared for people. When we recover food, we reconnect to humanity, we reconnect to nature. Our food comes from nature, it comes from the earth. And when we re recover food, we connect back to nature. So when we think about you know, the land recognition that Malvika started it off, us off with, we can recognize the land that we are all on when we don't throw away our food. Um, and I just want you all to know that you can be part of this. Um, now, I know sometimes in our refrigerators at restaurants, you know, we throw away food sometimes. It's about the process, not perfection. So don't worry. Please release yourself of any guilt. You know, it's about feeding people in methods that make sense. Um, so you can help by starting, you know, chapters. You can help by ensuring, you know, the places that you know that there is food, that they have recovery programs. Connect us to these places. Um, spread the word. Um, and, and I just wanted to close with one last thing before I pass things over to Dr. Gwen Baxley, which is, um, you know, food and water, right? When we recover food, we're not wasting that precious water. 23% of our potable water goes to producing food that we then throw away, 23%.
And I just needed to, to, to conclude by food, water is a human right. And if anybody, they, if they call themselves a policymaker or a lawmaker, or whatever the hell they think they are, if they tell you it is against the law to give somebody water, do not listen to them. This is exactly when you need to get into that good and necessary trouble. Water is a right. Love all you. Thanks for the opportunity. Passing the mic over. I'm going to burst into tears now. <laughs> Dr. Gwen Baxley. Thank you um, so much for Regina Snap Snap to just all of the, the wealth of information that you share with us. And thank you, everyone that has shared thus far, Damaris, Nicole, Bishop, um, Malavik. Um, I, I really, I'm, I'm feeling full right now. Um, given everything that I've, I've heard and you've shared. And I also want to um, give a shout out again to you, uh, Dr. Bishop, for providing me with this opportunity to, to, to be in community with everyone. And also a shout out to, to Dr. Yolanda Sealy Ruiz, who is someone that is a colleague, a, a dear sister, who is someone that um, brings light to me, inspires me in a number of different ways. Um, so I'm going to, to read a poem called Dream. As someone who identifies as a poet, as a professor, I draw on anti-Blackness as a theoretical tool to understand our current realities, our historic realities, thinking about Black suffering, Black non-humanity, um, but also um, anti-Blackness is a tool not only to think about that, but also thinking about Black resistance, a tool for inspiration, a tool to think about Black futures, Black visions, Black realities, Black re replenishment, similar to, to, to what Nicole was mentioning earlier. And so building on this idea of the, the stratosphere, building on this idea with um, of anti-Blackness in conversation with the stratosphere, I wrote this poem last night. Um, I finished it not too long ago <laughs> before, before we uh, went live um, and it's a poem thinking about another realm of blackness beyond our current run, one. And it's, again, it's called uh, Dreaming. I daydream of tomorrows. I dream of a future filled with galaxies, black, starry, big, where I am the king of Mars run the streets of Neptune, flee away from the decay of Earth, a future that feels like Venus, a Venus that was always home. But somehow I became astray, lost along the way. Somewhere in my dreams, my future is buffet style. Everybody eats, everybody feasts. In my dream, everybody sleeps because every day feels like weekend. Feels like a king size cotton soft comforter snoozing, snoozing against my skin. The sun sleeps in because there are no plans today, just rest. My future is brown lips stretched wide, open as the universe. Our laughter loud and booming supernovas. This is my future, dying of laughter, not by bullets or, or knees or necks, but our cackles causing a scene, exploding at the seams, beautifully bright and gleaming. I dream of a future slow dancing with the stars. Isley Brothers playing softly in the background. My future is my aunt's hands wrapped around my bones like rings of Saturn, warm, welcoming. Everything will be okay here. You are safe here, breathe. Tomorrow feels like the breath that's been taken from too many of us. Feels like life, feels like spaceship, bursting away from the decay of Earth. Earth feels like five, Four, three, two, one, take off. I dream of takeoffs. I dream of tomorrows. Thank you. And then I'll pass it off to uh, Nassim. Sorry, I had to come off mute and give you a woo. Yeah, that, was we, that was beautiful. Um, thank you, Gwen, for that. That was really, really beautiful. Um, I kind of feel like Nicole said, how am I supposed to follow that now? Uh, I feel like I had written so many things based on what I wrote for the Brooklyn Rail. And, and now maybe I want to talk about um, something a little bit different. Um, 
you know, I had written, I wrote a piece called Anti-Racism at the Borderlands of Whiteness, uh, which came out of a conversation that Bishop and I had about both being mistaken for white men um, from time to time. And then that process when someone thinks you're a white man and then looks at you and reassesses and then things shift and change and you're like, wait, what happened to my privileges? They were just there. Um, and, and that conversation got me going in a whole other direction. Uh, as a history teacher, I'm it's, we've been living through historic times. Like how many times have you heard that over the last year that we're living through historic times? And, and most of that history has been really, really bad. Um, and, and many people have been shocked, myself included over and over again. And I feel like that's because, you know, we live in the United States of amnesia where most Americans have no sense of their own history at all. And so we keep getting shocked when we learn new facts about history. You know, when I learned there was a rally of Nazis in 1939 in Madison Square Garden with 30,000 people. I was like, what? Is that true? Um, when I learned about the bombing, you know, of, of uh, the move bombing in Philadelphia in the 80s, I was like, there's no way that happened. Um, the end of reconstruction with, you know, when white supremacists overthrew the election of a president. I was like, wait, you sounds like you're exaggerating. Um, you know, all of these things that all of these moments in our history that we keep getting shocked at because our sense of ourselves and the story that we live in is a mythology. It's not, it's not based on facts. Um, and, uh, and it's a real problem that we have. We have a real information gap. And I'll say that, especially for white people. I've been thinking about white people a lot um, in, in, in these last four years or so. Um, it's a real information gap that we have a uh, real understanding gap that we have. Um, and even, you know, in, in nice ways when people say, you know, uh, when Biden comes out and says, you know, this is not who we are, and we're like, yeah, this is exactly who many of us have been and we're not really grasping that reality, um, which is really scary to me because, um, you know, I said years ago to a friend of mine, we were talking about climate change and I was just saying, you know, the human brain is not designed to deal with threats like that. We did not evolve to be able to manage large, systemic, slow-moving, abstract threats. Um, we are we evolved to respond to you know tigers and and lions and snakes and like really immediate threats that so we can re respond to that. Our we evolved to learn through stories and in our stories all of us are the protagonist and we are the good people. And we need like a villain to respond to. And I was like, we need a villain. We need like a personification of the problem that we can all respond to. It's not my fault that Trump got elected, right? I didn't call that into existence. I was just saying we needed a villain. And he presented the most perfect villain. Like he could not have played that role better. He connected all of the issues together in the most outrageous way. And uh, for the last little while, What's really been scaring me is, you know, you look at history and I'm you know, saying we're really headed for a very serious crisis, at which point we either go hard right or hard left. Um, and we are seeing, you know, when, our, when people lose faith in the systems, they are open to more radical ideas. Um, in the Great Depression, people were open to dictatorship. Um, they were also open to socialism. They were questioning democracy. They were questioning capitalism. Uh, that didn't go super well at the end of the 30s. Um, right now, globally, you know, we're seeing the rise of these fascist movements within our own country. We're seeing this emerging fascist movement, which has really been scaring me. Uh, and then I see these like overlapping crises. And these are just the recipe for a real radical change. And I've been thinking about how um, it would be very easy for that radical change to go in a hard right direction. We have billionaires with a ton of power. We have this emerging, you know, white identity, terrorism. Uh, we have a global fascist movement. Um, and it's not hard for people to, to follow those things. But we also have these other radical things uh, on the left, right? These progressive ideas um, that people are also open to. And so I think when I think about the radicalization that's happened over the last little while, I think you know, Trump definitely radicalized his base, um, but he also radicalized a lot of other people. And so a lot of ideas that would not have been discussed a few years ago now are openly discussed. Um, the abolitionist framework, you know, is re-emerging. And I, and I, as a history teacher, I always talk about, you know, the radical abolitionists who believed that slavery should end immediately and that black people should be full citizens with the ability to participate in society and politics. And that was radical 
a lot of people were like, slavery is bad, it's terrible, it's cruel, it's brutal, it's horrible. Um, but they couldn't imagine that. Well, and that slowly over time, there's a, how would society work without this institution? Um, and so what was a radical idea then, we all look at back now and say, look, this is the obvious right and just choice. And so I'm not, a lot of people are complaining about the polarization of our society. And I don't think that's the problem at all. I don't think the polarization itself is a problem. I think the fact that we have now really distinct camps that are going further and further to the poles is probably a good thing. Um, I, the, the fascism is a problem. Uh, the white supremacy is a problem. But the fact that we are not kind of arguing over these middle ground tactics, which would not solve our problems, is not bad in and of itself. We need a radical shift. Uh, Regina was just talking about climate change and how we missed the boat. Uh, I teach 13 year olds as well. And it is really amazing to think about the fact that they are living in a time in their childhood where objectively, right, they have reason to be concerned on an existential level. They are facing an existential threat from adolescence. As soon as they are able to intellectually understand it, that is the threat that's coming at them. And it's quite overwhelming to think about. Um, and yet, you know, as Malvika said at the very beginning of this, all of these different issues that seem to be separate and distinct are actually very much connected. You know, so in the same way that when you solve one problem, you're also solving another. You know, so when you save food, you're also helping climate change, you're also helping hunger, and, you know, and that hunger is also, you know, helping to end poverty, and this is also helping to bring dignity to workers, and you're, and you're, you're able to achieve a lot. Um, and that's one thing that's giving me hope is that, you know, this exploitate, the system of exploitation, um, colonialism, racial capitalism, uh, seems now uh, the norm, the way things have always been. But when I look at history, uh, things can change very quickly, which has been a source of fear for me for the last four years. Um, and is now, for the first time, I'm starting to see a glimmer of hope, honestly. Um, it's kind of like every winter I get a little depressed, this winter a little more than usual. Uh, and then when spring comes and I go outside for that first warm day, I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, and you get a feeling in your chest, you're like, what is that weird feeling in my, you're like, oh, that's happiness. I feel good just being out, the sun is on my face. I feel warm. I can see my friends. Like, what is this odd feeling I don't recognize? You're like, oh, I'm just happy to be alive. Um, and so I'm feeling a little bit of that now, but also, you know, I was, I had very little faith in the Biden administration and yet I'm seeing glimmers of hope of things that are actually a little bit more progressive than I was expecting. I'm seeing movements that are building strength, that are winning battles that I, I was skeptical that they could win. Um, again, it's piece by piece. But one thing about large systemic change is that it looks so far away, looks like it can't possibly happen. And then it does, um, it happens faster than you think. Um, and nobody could really predict what the world would be like. You know, when most of the world lived in kingdoms, you know, you couldn't really predict well, how, what else could there be? You know, um, when most of the world was colonized by a small little bunch of European countries, people couldn't imagine what would it be like for that to end, you know, and, and it does. And so I really feel like we are approaching in the next few years, a very radical shift. Um, and I think it really does come down to the rhizomatic connections, the strength of our connections, because we are facing an opposition that is well-funded, well entrenched. Um, and it, I think it really will depend on our the strength of our networks. Um, and the solidarity networks that have come up around around COVID have been beautiful. Um, I think it really depends on the strength of our networks and presenting a new vision, the circular economies, the cooperatives, the things that our people are building on a small scale. We need those, even if they're not at the scale at all to address the enormity of the issues we're facing. We need a new model. When people say, okay, we've lost faith in this system. What else can we do? We need a new model to look at and say, boom, here it, here's something that we can do. It's working at a town level. It's working at a village level. It's working at a municipal level. Can we expand this out? And that's giving me uh, a bit of hope um, for the first time in, in a while. And I would just say, you know, these are the, we have to recognize the times that we're in. I think at the, you know, in our last election, I was talking to a lot of people, you know, and we're like, we want to get back to kind of like decency and normalcy um, we don't live in normal times. We live in revolutionary times. These are the times that we, we live in. We haven't chosen it. These are the times that we live in. We live in revolutionary times. And I honestly believe that if we don't do any activism, you know, for the rest of our lives, 
this is the time when we need to push hard because this is the time when profound change is will happen. We just have to decide what direction will it go. Um, and I, I think that's really important. I, I wrote in my piece that one of the things I think we really need to see happen, we have um, an information gap in our understanding of history. We have an empathy gap. Uh, white people have a profound empathy gap when it comes to black people. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm born and raised in Canada. I've lived, lived in this country 22, 23 years. Uh, and, and it has been a process of understanding American society to really learn, to really learn it. And I just want to say one thing to exemplify that empathy gap real quick. Uh, sometimes when I have conversations with people, um, white people who maybe don't necessarily agree, when the Confederate statues, the protests around the Confederate statues, and so, well, it's our history, da, 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 whatever, whatever. And I told somebody, you know, imagine a Jewish kid in Germany walking past a statue of Hitler on her way to the Goebbels School of Media and Information, right? Could you imagine a girl going through that? No, absolutely horrific. What do you think it is like, right, to pass by Confederate statues and go to a school named after Confederate leaders? Ah, I see your point. Why do I have to transpose? Why do I have to make the example? And I find, find myself doing this several times that, you know, I'm a half Jewish myself to say, well, if it was a Jewish and people are immediately like, oh, absolutely, that would be bad. Why can we only, have that level of empathy and understanding for other people, right? And, and it is a profound lack. Uh, and I really do think that this country needs a truth and reconciliation commission where we uncover the, the depths, uh, the, the, the lattice work of policies, the stories and stories and stories that people find one at a time. You know, people watch The Watchmen and they're like, what, Tulsa, Oklahoma, what happened? Um, and there's so many of those stories that, that need to be uncovered and this needs to lead to reparations. I don't believe we can have justice in this country without a serious reparations program. Um, that's just personally my feeling. But I would say that I do for the first time start to see a glimmer of hope. I'm a, I, tried, I strive to be a rational person, a reasonable person, a scientific thinker. And there's a, I will just say one, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I'm looking at society and objectively, I did not have much reason for hope. And yet it is irrational not to be hopeful because you must be hopeful if we're going to win. So there was no rational reason to have hope, but it would be completely irrational not to be hopeful because it is a necessity. Um, and so I find myself in that, in that bit of, in that bit of uh, tension. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I am. And I, I'll just say that I'm gonna pass the mic next to Carolyn, um, thank you so much, Bishop, for having me in. It's so lovely to see everybody. Thank you for that, Nassim. Um, that was just brilliant. Um, and as a fellow educator, I'm just I'm resonating with so much of what you're seeing here. And I, I just want to thank the panelists that have spoken already. Thank you, Bishop, for bringing us together. Um, this is so inspiring and powerful for all of us to be in this moment together and to connect um however virtually to, to be able to be here um nicole what you said at the beginning just about storytelling and and you just brought me back where we were a year ago right um i've been spending so much time reflecting on this what it was like to walk streets that were basically empty the only sounds were the sirens everywhere um and, and yet to see spring coming to life and see things blooming, but also just knowing that there was just so much death around us. Um, and Nassim talking about being in this revolutionary moment where we have the power to really, really make radical change and that we have to do that. It, it's, it's been a struggle this year to be teaching remotely and to be teaching in so much uncertainty um, and to see with so much frustration, while we have the opportunity to completely rebuild our educational systems, that white supremacy keeps trying to reconstruct systems that not only didn't work and don't work, but are breaking people. Um, it's so frustrating to see people trying to figure out how we get kids back in buildings to take standardized tests that don't measure anything except for deficits um, and in, in inequality. Um, and so in this moment, um, I was actually at the same panel that Nicole mentioned earlier, the restorative justice panel, 
last Thursday talking about accountability, talking about community, talking about healing. And it really gave me some time to think about what are the practices that we have individually, collectively to heal. And when we think about the, the burning embers that Regina was talking about and the sustainability of our work together, um, I, I think it's so important that we really take the, the time to breathe in those practices that can sustain us. And for me, it's poetry. Um, I read a poem every day to my students. Um, and I, I almost cried actually hearing Dr. Baxley read her poetry. I mean, it's just, to me, it's so moving, it's so powerful, it's so life-giving. Um, and so I wanna just take a few minutes here to read a couple of stanzas from a poem that moved me a lot last year. And as we're thinking about this one year anniversary of living in the world with COVID, um, it's a poem called Wash Your Hands by Dory Midnight. And it's a beautiful meditation on, on thinking about um, washing our hands figuratively, literally, metaphorically, um, and also about taking the moment to think to rethink the practices that we have, to rethink um, what is sustaining us, what's giving us life, and what um, what we can rebuild. So I want to just read a few stanzas from this, um, the beginning of it, and then toward the end, just to to meditate on this moment. Wash your hands. We are humans relearning to wash our hands. Washing our hands is an act of love. Washing our hands is an act of care. Washing our hands is an act that puts the hypervigilant body at ease. Washing our hands helps us return to ourselves by washing away what does not serve. Wash your hands like you are washing the only teacup that your great grandmother carried across the ocean. Like you are washing the hair of a beloved who was dying. Like you are washing the feet of Grace Lee Boggs Beyonce, Jesus, your auntie, Audrey Lord, Mary Oliver, you get the picture. Like this water is poured from a jug your best friend just carried for three miles from the spring they had to climb a mountain to reach. Like water is a precious resource made from time and miracle. My friends, it is always true these things. It has already been time. It is always true that we should move with care and intention, asking, do you wanna bump elbows instead with everyone we meet? It is always true that people are living with one lung, with immune systems that don't work so well, or perhaps work too hard, fighting against themselves. It is already true that people are hoarding the things that the most vulnerable need. It is already time that we, we might want to fly on airplanes less, and not go to work when we are sick. It is already time that we, we might want to know more of who is in our neighborhood, who has cancer, who has a new baby, who is old with children in another state, who has extra water, who has a root cellar, who is a nurse, who has a garden full of elecampane and nettles. It is already time that temporarily non-disabled people think about people with chronic illness and disabled folks that young people think about old people. So I wanna just um, leave it there and um, thank all the people that, that have been sharing in this panel. I wanna thank uh, a few people also that have inspired me in my work with students this year. Damaris, I know we haven't met in person, but I've used your piece about black joy is not canceled with my students. And um, just having the chance to share our stories of joy and survival is something that I think is what we need to hold on to more and more as we move forward in this world together. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Iana. Thank you so much, that was so beautiful. Um, and to Carolyn's point, I feel so connected to, um, to all of you. And I feel like I've learned so much from all of you, even those who haven't, I, I haven't met, um, which is most of you um, through Dr. Bishop, just the conversations that we've been able to have and through reading the pieces in the book and rail um, and getting through this difficult year as a teacher. And of course, just as a human being, I think, you know, um, I feel so grateful for everything that, um, that you've all, you know, um, offered. 
Um, so thanks again to Dr. Bishop for the honor of, of having me um, here, to Malvika and Nick for organizing this and being so welcoming, um, to Nicole, Damaris, Regina, Dr. Baxley, Nassim, Carolyn, and to Tamsin and Adam coming up. Um, again, I'm really just so honored and grateful to be with you all. Um, so in the spirit of Nicole's storytelling that she opened us up with so, so wonderfully, I'm gonna tell a, a brief story as well, starting at December of 2019, when my high school creative writing students and I were trying to take a break from traditional writing exercises. Um, I brought a bunch of magazines in, we were fumbling through them, cutting out you know, images and words and things that we wanted, we were just sort of spent and, um, you know, what we thought was really at that time burnt out with everything at the end of a semester. And we just felt like all we could do at that point was cut words from magazines and start moving the pieces around and see what happened. And as I started doing that with one, um, you know, section of my poster board, almost Ouija board style a message emerged. And it was, I'm still here. I keep pursuing an unrelenting apocalyptic dance party. And when one of my students saw it, he was like, oh my God, Mrs. O'Pedi, you're like a genius, which is the great thing about high school students. Sometimes they'll really um, pep you up. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know about that, but you know, I decided to start leaning into that, to that particular type of you know, genius, so to speak, as 2020 began. And I decided to make my word of the year collage, which literally means from the French word um, to glue. Um, so toward the start of the pandemic, as my senior students were graduating, I decided to write something for them in collage form because I really had no idea what to tell them. Um, and the only thing that seemed to help was trying to push these pieces around on the piece of poster board. So I'll just read that. Um, first, beautiful starts here, a forbidden city that lures you beyond risk and scarcity. Nature awake, soft and malleable, the iridescence of stained violet, the near magical power of a great soul inspired, the harsh luminous guides, a canopy of gilded blues. We know we want epiphany, the secret fire, but vanity and regret shake, shade the light. Do you know people lie? The leading advance to tame a glow layers, layers deep. What matters? Nothing, no matter. Another impossible granite wall, the horizon, no sunshine. Until a rare spirit, Maybe patience tears the core, thinning your uncertainty from the inside out. No need to make the dark surface brighter. Attempt to shed endless consistency. Find ways to nourish instinct, but also timeless reason. Find new roads, live. Remember, voyages, they don't promise elegance. Your key, the sun, radiant in you. So um, throughout the summer, I kept making these. My children were roaming through the yard and finding all these natural elements for me to glue onto them, which was really um, exciting. Um, they became kind of like notes to self, but also notes to, to friends, to loved ones, to communities that I'm part of. You know, and more broadly, my hope was in, this, in a sense to humanity in general, you know, messages that I felt like I could um, channel and, and try to share. Um, and it, for me personally, it became a, for, a source of healing and um, restoration, one that allowed me to relieve some of the self and society imposed pressure to perfectly align pieces into some false semblance of complete cohesion and start bringing the pieces together instead into a messy sort of harmony that allows them to just be. Um, so the one that I wrote uh, midsummer um, came from, I cut out a little title from an Atlantic article called How Poetry Came to Matter Again um, and just started pulling more pieces together. We've made quite a name for power, for petulance, for staying safe and silent. We love knowing history, tradition, and prudent behavior, but discourage curiosity. The revolutionary watch ancient tradition through the galleries of time, searching for more ideas and provocation to be inspired to lift up to be stronger together, to free the story of humanity from centuries of deep and dark battle with warriors of private ambition, of retreating from cohesion, of war memorials ravishing windswept heaps and sacred sanctuaries. Is it possible to belong as something other than what we are, to reveal without feeling shame? Being human, being mad, who could object? We age again, scars accumulate, fault lines animating a different light, reclaim them 
for you, identity lies in seeking rare insight and internal sunshine. The big question, how will you live true? How will you change us? The little things that never settle, the things we can't leave. You, a, per a person standing on the moon, looking back at Earth, mirrorless like me. Save your life, trust wonder. Embark on the journey toward divine vision. Travel far into the blue. Access the helm, choose your view. Your arrival creates love that resists fading, a haven of peace beyond the distraction of unrighteous treasures. A place to rejoice and reimagine society, sense, and aesthetic, where sounds heighten your experience and ascent, where gracious details reveal, intensify, or reinterpret the sketch, where there is no end to art and sight, a place worth the sight. All my pages have become more pieces for me to assemble. Um, so as, a, as this process of transformation took hold, I found myself releasing a lot of the baggage, um, you know, taking out the trash to use doc, a phrase Dr. Bishop shared with me, um, Sakala Basura, um, and tapping into intuition, which freed up my voice to be able to speak the kinds of truths that now can at times um, speak with less fear. Um, and so I'll just end with my most recent piece um, titled Try Space. My word of 2021 in part is space. Try space methodically to be more precise. Um, and I'll just end with that. You say the sadness I feel is hardwired, a mountain of melancholy, but the house's foundation is shifting. Open your eyes in the depths of emotion to discover creative powers of observation. There, a stranger approaches you brightly in the shadows, lighting their vision of the world. Rivers of wonder, a place where burnout zooms into an abyss and ignites a vulnerable chaos that moves you. A serene backdrop for a vibrant revolution of taking your sacred space back from occupying forces and finding your own source of oxygen. Thank you again for allowing me to be with you all and um, to share. And uh, Tamsin, I pass the mic to you. Thank you. Um, I wanna echo the gratitude that everybody, you know, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so happy to meet everyone and be in the same space with you and uh, just so much and thinking about so much. Um, so I don't usually write things and I didn't write for the rail. I made some work for Bishop's piece uh, so like I have a script. So if you see me looking down and like, look, I'm, I'm reading from the script. I'm trying the best I can, but I'm going to share my screen. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'm an artist and I teach in higher ed and I've been teaching for about a decade. And often we have this conversation in my classrooms about what is an art practice. And a lot of times the answers kind of revolve around what we think we can gain from an art practice. So like money, fame, followers, a job, an exhibition. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with those answers. And my answers tend to be the same um, at times. But I've started thinking about how can an art practice, um, can an art practice make you happy? What would it mean to define an art practice as a means to make you happy? So I was really excited when I heard uh, Nicole start start this conversation about self-care so like along those same lines like how can we work in an art practice for inner peace and inner happiness so if you define an art practice that way it becomes an opportunity uh, ruminating for reminiscing exploring asking questions experimenting and I don't think that means to dismiss the seriousness of the day um, it means maybe just approaching it a little bit differently and looking at those things that are happening around us that causes so many feelings of fear and despair and allowing for a kind of play. And I mean that as like a freedom to allow ourselves to take risks in an art practice while thinking about these things, to be funny when things do not seem funny, like because maybe we still need to be funny um, and allowing ourselves to fail. So, all the while holding space for those big feelings, the bad feelings and the good feelings. And in that art practice and in holding that space, sharing that space with others and then seeing where we end up at the end of the art practice. 
And so the practice started to become the important part for me, not necessarily like the piece that was being produced or if it leads to job or exhibition or what. And so it becomes this kind of liminal space, this like threshold, like what could be and what could be next. Um, static time, carving out a place to be happy, to give freely and to possess that cool confidence that comes when being fully present um, of being without the worry of having to define what it means to be present or what it means to be and just being. Um, so at the top of 45's presidency, I didn't even like see that, that iceberg coming. I was, I was in my feelings in my own way, uh, but I was working hard trying to crack the code to make the artwork, to get the job that I wanted, to get an exhibition, to sell work, um, to make friends and have influence, you know, as we do. And luckily on my way to the inevitable like crashing and burning out, I was able to pause um, and begin to forgive myself for being so unkind and not honoring myself and not taking care of myself um, and really shifted my practice and allowing myself to be, to be me and to be myself. Um, and the work became more honest and fulfilling in the making. And it became a little bit more funny and more serious at the same time. Um, but ultimately a wonderful experiment and exploration that allowed me and still allows me moments of peace. And in that, to find those moments of happiness. Um, so this is like 2016, 2018, again, before like, I could see that iceberg of 45's presidency, but so it meant doing things like this. So like making prints, uh, using imagery of like AK-47s and wiener dogs and hot dog buns, because I don't know how to think about mass shootings. I don't know how to talk about mass shootings with my students. I don't know why it makes sense that uh, the right to have a gun and like barbecuing on the 4th of July or like hand in hand in America um, so like getting it out and holding space and trying to like work through it. Things like this, Mother's Day bouquet, um, subtleties of just uh, sex and moms need it too, I don't know. Uh, gender, so I love somebody with armpits. So just these like big confusing ideas, um, not confusing, but complicated and trying to take space for those. This is a body of work that I've, worked on for several years. So it spans a bunch of time. Um, so now well into 45, 45's presidency and this uh, habit of his to utter phrases like, you know that I love you. As if that like, you know, takes away the sting of whatever horrible thing he's doing. Um, halfway through 45's presidency, my partner got pregnant with our son insisted that he was waving between her legs like hi world for like the whole last trimester so also this kind of piece with the humor and the horror of like you don't know what's going to happen until the labor's done so 2019 2020 again not seeing that iceberg that's like looming the new iceberg um a lot of things have changed in the last year for i think probably all of us we have a new baby in our house. So time in the studio has become more precious or less precious. I'm not really sure which, but time is a thing <laughs> that I'm trying to find again. But uh, the work continues to shift. And my son is three years old now and he's talking a little bit and he's really interested in snakes and flowers and skeletons. So again, the work shifts. And when he visits me in the studio, uh, he can run around the room pointing at things and exclaiming snake, flower, skelly, and that makes me happy. And that's kind of where I'm at. And my lights are on a timer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so I'm gonna pass the mic back to Nick, I think. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Tamsin. Uh, I'm gonna jump in and go rogue. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, I just wanted I to say thank you. I think now it would be wonderful, a wonderful place to move to uh, Dr. Bishop's wonderful moderated discussion. Uh, and what I'm gonna, what we're going to do today is we're gonna combine audience Q and A and the moderated discussion into one beautiful rhizomatic uh, melange. So handing it over to you, Bishop. 
And I just want to say and shout out and super glad that he's here. Adam Faulkner is here to take us out of the hour. So by 155, like the educator in me is going to stop whoever's talking and give the mic to Adam. So just be prepared for that. Um, I mean, this is so powerful. You know, I've been talking to all the people that were just on this panel in the past days um, about what we're uplifting. And every single person who took the mic today is busy doing the work on the regular. Like if that's not already apparent to you, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it out loud. So I think a lot about what it means to amplify that. Like for all of the young people and graduate students and whoever they are who are studying, studying under these individuals, what does that mean? Like that's where you actually get rhizomatic or stratospheric with this stuff because it's the reach is way further than like Nassim shouted out like the strategy of like the impotent far right, but like they don't really have their shit together even if they have a lot of money. And I think we've got the ideas on our side. So we don't, we only have a few minutes. I know that there's maybe some questions that were coming in. Sometimes we throw the mic to Fong for a question too. Malvika, you dropped a question in the chat, but I'm curious if we can just open up for maybe questions, um, not just for me, for anybody on the panel for a few. Yeah, I think that would be beautiful if um, if any and all of you have any questions for each other, any questions that have, you know, come up during this fabulous uh, panel, this might be a great place to, to bring them up. And even just as we're thinking on the Malvika's question, and I'm going to like grab like right in the middle of it um, at minute 145 in the chat was like, what is your wildest prescription and dream? Like, you know, she's asking as like radical educators, kind of what's your... What's your vision? Who would be the edu what would be the education for a young person? But even like outside of education, like I say to Regina all the time, she's not like a quote unquote educator per se, but she's like a popular political educator. She like travels the country and the world schooling people on like hybrid socialism and food justice. So um, yeah, I think like where, if anybody who was on the panel or anybody in the space wants to jump on the like, what's your wildest prescription and dream? I like that question a lot. Yeah, Talin, I see you, go ahead. Oh yeah, I'm used to. We can't hear you, sorry. Talin, okay. you have, perfect. Yeah, just something uh, probably quite radical in terms of what we're talking about. Um, I, I campaign for animal rights uh, and I know that it sounds very much like, oh, we're humanity suffering from all this, like who wants to talk about animal rights? But since um, Regina, you were mentioning all the connections and that all the system is connected in terms of climate, humanity, all that, the, the ecosystem, everything, the balance. Um, don't you think, how, can, how do you think that these two communities and these two, let's say sides can work together in relation to the welfare of both without looking like you're kind of out of place or because every time I mention those things and that side of thing, you know, feeding my foxes and all the rest of that. Um, um, it sounds like uh, or you're paying for certain charities or whatever you're doing, you know, this, the whole system is broken, let's say. How can you see that um, the connection and how can we not convince but make sense of the whole the wholeness of it all the holisticness of it without sounding like you know, you're just kind of out of your senses going like, all right, the world isn't, you know, um, I mean, it's also political, isn't it? It's kind of active, there's active almost destruction. So what, how do you, how do you feel about it? That's a beautiful question. And um, I definitely would love to hear what others have to say about it. We can take things to small pieces, um, mm -hmm. compassion, and, and to the question that Bishop um, posed to all of us, when we walk in love, and I feel like Dr. Yoli would say something like that. That's that's my vision when we all walk in love. Um, and I don't want to flip side to that, you know, when we walk in love. So um, we all have a network and a part to play. Um, and I, I think about it in terms of with the rhizome. I also think about it in terms of we need wrenches, we need hammers, we need wood to build bridges and help people walk or roll or however they are able to do that locomotion to one another. Um, we need people like for me, I say, I'm going to hold out my hand, but so far. So if you are bigoted, if you are homophobic, if you are all these things that you were taught, if you're believing in the myth, I can only go so far to you. You have to do the work to come to me. Um, when, but we also have to open up our hearts and our minds. 
I don't know everything that you know, Talene, about you know animals, animal rights, um, but I want to listen and, and talk with you. And from that, I can take the particles and, and infuse that into how I do my work. Um, poetry every day helps you to infuse those particles into your work. Um, and so when we start to think about it in terms of the components, we can see that there are parts of the system that are broken. There are parts of the system that aren't broken, but they're wrong. And we put in a nice wrench and we stop it for a little while while we while we all hold our hands around. You know, when you see a tent, if there's like a, a building that's being fixed, you know, they, they put the tent over. Let's do that on the places that are that are broken. Um, and, and that's how we can fix the full. But I think about when I was younger, um, there were there wasn't space for a lot of people. And now that we have to have that space for some people. So I need to learn and keep keep moving. So the system is in movement and we have to remember that, that it takes a lot of, the work should never be done if we do it the right way. And the more love and the more peace that we add into how we do our work, then the system, what we're trying to you know, fix becomes, it's a, it's a totally different kind of conversation. And the, um, the, the, when we do the September guest critic again in 2021, September, part of it for sure is gonna be about like reclaiming earth, really, truly, deeply, like eliminating plastic from our homes, like, like real things, real deep things. They connect to all of these, these entities, beings. Uh, we got two minutes for another question or anybody else who wants to jump on the wildest prescription. Adam's in the chat, Yana's in the chat. People are responding too. Y'all, I've also changed our uh, security settings so that anyone should be able to sort of unmute their mic and jump in at will. So I feel like this is a great moment for that. I'll pose maybe food for thought um that we may not get to here but i'm thinking of the slides that uh that nicole shared with us and thinking about this being a year a year after and uh recognizing the importance of rest and that rest is required for action and their interconnectedness um i'm really curious as most of you are educators specifically um how do you rest and take care of yourselves Tamara's good. I don't, I don't think I've been resting lately. I think I've been writing, um, but I think writing, so I'm thinking about writing and writing. So W-R-I-T-E and then write, R-I-T-E, right? Thinking about writing as a rite of passage. And so um, I think that is where I find mm -hmm. solace um, lately, lately. So I think my writing is somehow attached to my rest. Um, yeah, 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 for sure. And I'm throwing the mic to Adam. I think it's time. Like, I just, I want our poet in resident in the house to have his full five minutes. So let's throw the mic to Adam Faulkner because I'm super happy he's joining us. What up, Adam? Hey, everybody. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I mean, I, I was ready to keep going in the chat with these wildest prescriptions. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be in uh, your company today. Um, it feels good to be in a space with educators. It feels good to be in a space where we're actively talking about the ways in which we're trying to heal and think about that in the context of education. Um, shout out Bishop to you for this invitation. I'm really just trying to be like you when I grow up and appreciate any room that you're building is a well curated room. And uh, if, if we're doing our lives right, we're jumping from well curated room to well curated room and yours are nothing if not that. Um, and I so resonated with so much of, of, of all of the things that the speakers brought to the space, um, specifically this notion of uh, what's coming with us out of this year. Um, one of the ideas that I've tried to wrestle a lot with lately short of a wholesale re-education of white children in America, which we can sidebar about that if you want, uh, is about the things that I'm not quite ready to let go of. Yes, this has been a dumpster fire of a year, but there are so many ways in which I and so many people I love have been open to a kind of critical tenderness to each other and ourselves. And I almost fear the sort of lull back to whatever it was that we were doing before this past year that wasn't working to begin with. So 
Nicole, I appreciated a lot of your observations about lifting up what to take and, and, and what to leave, but recognizing that like, you know, we are opening in ways to each other uh, and to the world, right? And that was a beautiful poem, Carolyn, that you brought in that testified to that. And I'm not quite ready to see wash back out to sea. Um, so I'm gonna read a poem that, uh, that tries to convey that. Um, and, and part of the reason I've, I'm excited to read it, it, uh, it appeared in the Brooklyn Rail yesterday and it's called, So What If I'm Not Ready to Leave Yet um, for a, a special curated edition of the Brooklyn Rail by my dear friend and heart and colleague and comrade, Mahogany L. Brown. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. All right. So what if I'm not ready to leave yet? I like it in the house where it's warm, where my dog's paws smell of hot sleep and corn chips and every day is the same, but it is sad. So what if I like the way we check on each other now? Even if the forecast doesn't change, boxed light and ticker tape, a stiff gin to remind of the day to turn. I used to be bummed by all there was to want and how little time we got in the life of a single day to go get it. How every day was a refresh, a menu of metrics to measure my worth with, better light in an apartment, a better job, a boyfriend my friends love louder, a happier way to have your cake and eat it. But now, the life that could have been doesn't even really make sense. I don't want to secretly be a pop star anymore or a famous professor or a senator or whatever, depending on the day, my whiteness makes me think I can have. I'm working on it. But let's just say that I crave less. Let's just say that I starve for little more than the dust of a beloved's single dangling earring against stubble mid hug in a doorway on a street corner, the wheeze and wet air of laughter in a corner booth, palms pounding the table in good story, a single slung arm around a neck. This is the 354th straight day that I have closed my eyes and imagined this world. We do not return to the urgent violent plod of hard start times and efficient email follow-ups. The thirst for some almighty better fades like footprints in a rainstorm. I am saying I call them all nightly now. I'm saying I am in love with all things suddenly small and suddenly tender. I am flung wide open at the hinge and raw a wire scraped so far open, I could scream. Adam, thank you so, so much. Y'all, we are out of time. I am so profoundly inspired and moved and changed and I would be lost without all of you. So thank you for being here today. Nick Mavakam, I'm gonna let you just close out anything. Yeah, well, well done, thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop. Uh, and thank you to you, Adam, my God. Uh, dropped a link to the April issue critics page in which Adam uh, is a beautiful participant. Recommend everyone ch check it out. And of course, thank you to you, Regina, Gwen, Damaris, Carolyn, dear Nicole, Yona, Tamsin, what beautiful images, uh, Nassim. And of course, thank you, Bishop, again. And thank you to all of you. Uh, who tuned in today in the audience and in the chat. We're so excited to unveil this heartfelt restorative critical program and the next episode will be in four weeks time on Thursday, May 6th. I uh, hope to see you all there. We're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. So as a nonprofit, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider making a donation to keeping the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent. I also dropped a link in the chat to Food Recovery Network's donation page, uh, hit that up. Uh, and please join us again tomorrow when we blast off into new and uncharted territories. We'll be joined by Italian artist Giuseppe Pinone in conversation with writer Alexis Dehan and art historian Francesca Pietro Paolo. Uh, this conversation is uh, totally new. It'll be taking place through the magic of tech and live translation across continents in both Italian and English simultaneously, something that's been lovingly coordinated by our very own Nick Bennett. Uh, that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom, and I hope you'll join us 
for what will be truly a magical conversation. Uh, and yeah, thank you all so much. You can like unmute yourself and shout out your goodbyes and all your love if you'd like. Um, this has been just like so fabulous. Here, I'll send everyone. Thank you, everyone. Invitation. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, thank Dr. You, Baxley, Adam. for that beautiful poem. Thank you, so thank you, Adam, for your poem. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Regina. You so Thanks, Damaris. Thank you, Regina. Thanks, Thank you, 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 Sounds good. Yeah, people got students waiting. Thank you, educators. Thank you. Oh, thank you, educators. Thank you. Lots of love.